All right. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, 1045 on a Monday coming off the heels of uh, hockey state tournaments this week. As we look at our uh, um, agenda for today, uh, some thank yous uh, again for all of our admin reps who are participating in our tournaments and taking care of COVID protocols, uh, assessments, and so on and so forth, along with the screenings and being there. Thank you. Also for uh, coming out of hockey again, heading into basketball for myself, our 32 uh, quarter final games on the boys and girls side are our quarterfinal sites for our high schools uh, we couldn't do this without you thank you for the games for those of you who administered those and also just for all of our our um, ad's and our member schools who have hosted something as we conclude uh our winter season uh a shout out to you again and thanks for all your work and the number of compliments we received on those on those sites continue to come in so thank you very much um we're gonna really uh look at spring sports here as we enter into really week two for competition for some of our sports. We talked about winter season and a wrap up with some reminders there where we're at with competitive section updates. Uh, you'll get an update on uh, our website from Laura and then uh, upcoming MSHSL meetings that uh, you need to tune into or at least be aware of on your calendar and then we'll finish with our quick takes. Uh, let's uh, let's jump right into our spring sports. Uh, Eric, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk all things spring sports as to where we're at. Thanks, Bob, and good morning, everybody. Um, as you are well aware, new guidance came out from uh, from the league last week and clarifying where things are for mask and face covering guidances. Um, and uh, want you to know really clearly that uh, great efforts uh, on our part to uh, to get to a point where uh, we wouldn't be required to wear uh, masks or face coverings in competition uh, in our spring sports. Uh, we've only received clearance for that for individual competitions at this time. Um, and, uh, and we've had conversations with other entities around, uh, including folks like the MIAC, uh, and really also wrote a very specific request uh, to our Department of Health asking for uh, the the ability to have competition without masks and uh, seeing that there's lots of other things that we can do, mitigation strategies that would uh, assist us with that. Uh, and at this time, we're not there. And so again, it's the Department of Health that is requiring that competition have the masking involved, um, did write language around individual workouts in team sports, and that as long as everyone is spaced by six feet or more at all times, uh, that masks are not required uh, in individual workouts, even in a team sport. Um, and so as administrators working with your coaches to be able to, uh, to figure out how to do that, uh, certainly a possibility. Um, but again, uh, our goal continues to be that we move away from the requirement for masks uh, in our outdoor sports uh, at this time. So, um, you know, we're, we continue to push that. We know that right now the case counts are going in the wrong direction. Uh, and that is not assisting us in being able to move uh, away from uh, the masking aspect right now. Um, but we continue to ask and uh, been on conversations even as uh, recently as uh, last week, two or three times. So in thinking about how we progress through our spring sports and what we do there, um, interstate competition is one that we know happens on our border areas uh, on all sides. And so again, I ask that you make sure and review that if you are competing outside of the state or with teams that come from other states, uh, just make sure that you know what that looks like. Uh, the 50 mile limit is the, the limit that we put in place between two teams that might be competing. And if it is a multi-team event, that all teams would be within that 50 mile uh, limit between any two schools. And again, the goal there is to keep it regional. Some folks have taken that 50 mile limit and, and thought that that might be the case for in-state. Um, again, we want competitions to remain regional uh, and or local in nature. That could be your conference, that could be your section. Um, and that could be greater than 50 miles if everyone is inside of Minnesota. And so just know that that 50 mile number is related directly to interstate competition as we go forward. We know that again, we have multi-team events that take place in the spring. And so make sure that you're checking the guidance and, and understand what those limitations are. Um, and specifically track is one that has had an awful lot of conversations. Again, the limit there is 250 athletes and coaches all counted together. 
Uh, that is a requirement that it be less than 250 for those competitions. We've heard from many schools that say we have a number of schools with smaller numbers in our track. Can we have more teams involved? Uh, and so again, our recommendation uh, when it comes to number of teams is that we be at eight or less for track meets and or eight or less towns uh, or schools as it were uh, to be able to have those competitions. But again, that 250 number is what's out there. When it comes to golf, remember that golf is something that can be done without masks if everyone stays uh, appropriately spaced. So with that, the limit is 16 teams and 72 golfers. And folks wonder where the 72 golfers come from. And that happens to be one foursome per hole is where those numbers come from. And so if there are needs or situations uh, where folks would like to have more than that, uh, certainly talking with Jason Nickleby here at the league office about how to arrange that or address those could be a possibility, but we shouldn't have more than 16 teams involved. And what we recognized is as we had things a little bit more open in language initially, uh, all of a sudden things started to look very similar to what they've always been. And those being some very large events with many, many schools coming together. And again, that is certainly not the intent as, a, as we go forward from there. A number of our other sports are limited to four uh, teams per event and uh, make sure that you're paying attention to that as well. Finally, I wanna make sure and make mention of uh, the supervision piece that's required. Um, when we start having multi-team events and we have four or more schools that come together, it's critical that we have somebody who is on site and we saw it with our tournaments as well, someone who's going to be that COVID site supervisor to make sure that protocols are being followed and that we have the arrangements in place uh, that keeps the spacing that we need to have, make sure that the event is run as safely as possible. And so uh, that is uh, part of what bylaw 409 says in terms of providing the supervision to make sure an event is safe or appropriate uh, as, we, as we do that. So as a note, make sure that uh, you take a look at that. And again, uh, that COVID site supervisor could be an admin person or it could be someone designated by the school uh, to be on site to do that. And the, the requirement there is that it not be someone who's acting as a coach or an official because they have other roles in there as well. So some key points as we're getting ready for competition in a number of our activities this week. Um, Bob, I'll turn it back to you if there's other questions or things that, uh, that you saw that we should address. Yeah, no, Eric, I think you did a very nice job with explaining all things uh, around spring sports. Maybe if we could just back up for a moment here. One thing that I did hear some questions regarding around mass and, and Eric, I, and being involved in those conversations uh, to MDH, uh, again, around mass coverings with uh, spring sports and appre appreciate the advocacy there. Uh, the, the question around splash guards and or spit shields for things like catchers masks and or lacrosse helmets uh, we will have communications to see if those can be approved like they were uh, in hockey to be used for those spring sports so some of you that have reached out we are working on that as well uh, let's jump to baseball if we could as of Wednesday morning uh, you'll see reporting on game changers if uh, game changer is uh, uh, what we will be using our, our our pitch counts for, for this year for baseball coaches. So we have partnered with Game Changer. If your, um, your coach has registered uh, with the information that has, spent, has been sent out, uh, they will start re receiving reports as of Wednesday morning, I believe. Um, it's located on the, uh, the coach and or AD dashboard um, under baseball. Um, and then you'll note that you'll get those reports. So I've, I've already started to receive those uh, from Game Changer, just know that um, you'll start to see those prior to competition, make sure that you're registered and able to do so. Laura, anything I, I mentioned uh, or I missed uh, mentioning there around uh, Game Changer for baseball? Coaches who are um, registered will start to receive that on Wednesday. If a coach doesn't receive that, it means that they are not registered um, through a correct clip board or dashboard and having them reach out to us or having you reach out to us at that point would be helpful. But that will be the Wednesday morning about 1 a.m. They should receive the first report. Thank you, Lauren. There's a couple options in, uh, in how you can record pitch counts. One is to do the actual scoring through um, Game Changer. I'm going to call live scoring. The other is a more manual 
approach to the pitch counts. Both should um, uh, work according to our policy. Uh, know that those options are available through Game Changer. Let's head into uh, the winter season, I believe, um, and wrapping things up. So some of the individual awards and or trophies. In some sports, you will be receiving those uh, medals and trophies in some cases. Um, so just note that medals and or trophies will be coming out to you for those that uh, did medal or did get trophies and haven't received those as of yet. Those will be coming out to you. If you were in a team competition, um, like this past weekend in boys and girls hockey, trophies and medals were received uh, on site, whereas in some cases those are being sent out directly from our trophy provider, uh, both on the medals and trophies front. Uh, Lisa, if you are on with us, if you want to talk a little bit about uh, the most valuable teammate for those that were participating in state tournaments, uh, if you would go ahead and um, unmute Lisa and share with us uh, the MVT most valuable teammate option for schools. Sure. Thank you very much, Bob. And good after good morning, uh, everyone. Um, we are um, providing you with an opportunity, if you will, um, to name a most valuable teammate um, as part of, um, of, of, as, as, as part of an opportunity, as an opportunity to recognize young people in a different capacity. This individual is that individual who is the backbone of our activity programs. They uh, exhibit uh, leadership and, and sportsmanship. They are respectful, reliable, and uh, supportive of others. They're the first ones in the gym, the last one uh, in the gym to leave the gym. They're that individual who, if you need a helping hand, uh, they're there to uh, extend their hand. So these are the individuals that we're looking to uh, recognize. This is currently a statewide program that uh, each school is allowed to participate in and it's a, it's a weekly program that's sponsored by Wells Fargo. Um, as most of you are aware, we do name all tournament teams in, in most of our team events and uh, in the sport of football. However, because of the way that tournament uh, is formatted, uh, we're unable to do that. And so we came up with this concept of an MVT and uh, it has worked extremely well. So we're offering this opportunity for those of you who have participated in the uh, winter state tournaments and um, for you to identify a person on your team who meets all of the criteria here. And this to some degree takes the place of that the naming of that all tournament team as we're unable to do that uh, during the winter and most likely during the uh, spring tournament. So um, please go online and take a look at this. We uh, welcome you to uh, acknowledge these young people and lift them up at a time when they need it most. And uh, if and you do choose to do so, we would, um, we're going to come up with a way for you to share that information with us so that we can uh, have it for a matter of record for this organization and also share it back to the sponsor of this program. Um, Bob, if Laura, I'm not sure if, if you guys decided what that process will be. Um, if not, um, we can certainly share that information out later. Thank you very much, Lisa. And, and again, yes, there will be an option. Uh, provided uh, out to you to communicate who those individual individuals were so we can collect them in the form of a uh, either a Google Sheet or a Microsoft form. We'll collect that data from you. Again, we know our tournaments have looked different um, during a pandemic, and one of those things we want to continue to do is recognize those individuals that may have been recognized on an all-tournament team in the past that we've not been able to do so uh, during our tournaments at this time. Let's head on to the next slide, Laura, for competitive section placement. We are busy placing schools in competitive sections uh, around the state. And we'll conclude that uh, this week. Uh, AD's advisory will um, will meet next week to review those. Uh, and then our final board approval will take place on Friday, April 15th. Just a reminder, in competitive section placement, Competitive section placement is not done by competition, right? Competitive section placement is made um, under bylaw 400, the language is located, geographic contiguity, uh, making sure that those schools fit in a geographic area. We're not skipping over one school to get to another uh, for our, our sections. And then also section balance, depending on the number of, of um, teams in a section, or if it's a two class, three class, four class or seven class system in terms of football, 
uh, what that balance needs to look like. Typically it's uh, within two teams, but as the classes increase, uh, so does uh, the opportunity for the number of teams per section. So you could have a four team difference in terms of that balance. If you're interested in that language that is located uh, under bylaw 400, page 72, 73, that's where we're at this week. And then we'll start ramping up and we've already started the process with um, getting ready for our district football placement. Remember that timeline will uh, is out there and will conclude following uh, competitive section placement process. We can continue on there, Laura. And I think we're uh, over to you to talk about the website with updates. Laura? As we shared last week, schedules, results, and rosters are able to be synced from our schools currently into the website. Um, we did several over, overview introductory sessions last week, and we'll have one more of those this week, Tuesday at noon. I um, highly recommend that you or someone in your office attend those to get an overview of the big picture of how, how it works. Um, knowing that each of you is at a different stage with our schools and what you use and which features you currently use, um, we'll be doing some focused trainings and providing some additional resources for you in the upcoming days. Um, this will include things like importing students into our schools. If you use another registration system, um, that becomes an import that you can do. Um, we know that there are people who have set up co-ops in a number of ways throughout the years. And as that has evolved in our schools, there may be some changes that you would want to make in co-ops to have those function better. Things like enrolling and assigning coaches, if that's going to be a duty that you're going to give to your coaches to build their rosters and or put their results in, or if that's something that you're going to manage within your office. So as you see in the next couple of days coming out that um, targeted training and resources, again, knowing that everyone is at a different spot with that, please pay attention to those to know which sessions would benefit you, your coaches or others within your office. Um, it's exciting to have this starting now at the beginning of spring season so that we're able to get spring sports in with roster schedules and results to have those ready for our spring sports. So watch for more information and just be aware that that is happening as we're moving forward. I'm going to move back to, I believe, Eric to talk a bit about some upcoming meetings across the organization. Thanks, Lauren. Do you want to just buzz back to slide three? Uh, I know some questions have been coming in around site supervisor. And so let me just offer a couple of thoughts and we will provide some additional information here. So people are asking questions um, through chat and otherwise around. So what does this look like or what's the responsibility? Really what the focal point is and the same thing that we did with our tournaments and are doing with our tournaments is to think about what is the activity or what is the event? that we're in charge of and what needs to take place in order for things to operate according to the protocols and the requirements that are out there. So certainly masking is a portion of that, but that is not the uh, sole purpose of that. Really, it's around what does it look like from the time that teams arrive or individuals would arrive and how is the event going to take place? So in golf, it might be where should they arrive? How should they be located? How are they going to find out what holes they go to? How do we make sure and keep those large group gaps? gatherings from happening. What we notice is without real specific direction and someone taking the lead that we fall back into typical patterns of behavior. Um, and so if it's four teams coming together for a softball event at a municipal uh, set of, uh, of fields, how do we arrange that and where should they be and what are the expectations going forward? And someone should be communicating with those coaches and each of those teams to make sure they know what that looks like. If you think about a track meet, there's lots of detail uh, that needs to be addressed and, and covered as to what does it look like for the track meet to take place at this location. And so it's going to be that lead person to say, here's the safest way that we're going to do this. Here's how we're going to clerk for our events. Here's the lanes that we're going to run in um, and putting all of those things in place. And then again, obviously getting assistance from schools to make sure that they're following through with the protocols as we go forward. So again, we will update the guidance there but that COVID site supervisor would be really the key uh, communicator in terms of what those protocols and uh, the event details would be to keep that event as safe as it can be. Uh, like I said, the cases are going up uh, and we're seeing some of that transmission and that, that is challenging for us 
Uh, and we'd love to not have masks and not have all the requirements, yet that is still where we are right now. So hopefully that helps and we will get more information out to you. All right, we can jump back to uh, meetings that are coming up here in the next week. Um, Bob did a great job of talking through competitive section placement. Um, our AD advisory group will look at those uh, placements next Wednesday, the 14th, review each one of those. That uh, meeting will be lengthy. Uh, and that group has done a great job with that in the past. And I know they'll do it uh, again this time around. Our board meeting was scheduled for April 1st. Obviously with the way the tournaments played out, that wasn't going to work. We moved back to next Thursday, April 15th. So we will have uh, a board meeting there, um, taking a look at things like spring postseason. What's that gonna look like? What's the plans and, and how will that play out? I know folks are anxious uh, to have that detail. Um, also taking a look ahead to the 21-22 calendar and uh, we'll approve a, uh, a tentative schedule for our seasons for the 21-22 school year. Uh, and the goal there is obviously to, uh, to put that in place and have that be as accurate as possible so people can get all of their uh, schedules in place and, and start building all of that knowing that uh, this is when seasons will start and then when postseason is going to be underway. And then obviously the approvals of the competitive sections and the administrative region assignments uh, that are going on, that will be another part of that board meeting as we go forward and obviously continuing to um, manage and address where the league is at uh, on a number of other fronts, including finance uh, policies and so on as we continue through this, uh, this current year. Following that uh, in, in May, in the second Tuesday, which is the typical time period for our representative assembly, we're anticipating a virtual meeting for rep assembly. We did one last November um, and we are back on a typical schedule. And there are two items that are on the agenda. Uh, and those are both uh, the uh, consideration for additional activities for the league. And so that is boys volleyball and girls wrestling. And those have both gone through the process of each region committee reviewing it. Both of them have met the limit of 50% or more uh, approval by the uh, by the regions. And so those are up for vote at the rep assembly meeting, which is on Tuesday, May 11th. And again, at this time that is planned for a virtual uh, meeting and we'll do that via Zoom. Um, if anything would change, we'll obviously be communicating with folks as soon as possible. There was some hope that vaccination wise and so on, we might be able to get back to in-person. Uh, that is looking less likely at this time. And so we are gonna move forward with a plan for a virtual event for rep assembly. Couple of things happening and uh, and we'll continue forward. So Bob, I think it's back to you. Yeah, actually we're gonna uh, turn it over to Laura to uh, uh, come to the conclusion here today in quick takes, Laura. Great, thanks. Couple things just quickly. Uh, we have added an additional head coaching course after hearing from a number of you that you were having some challenges and concerns with some of your head coaches getting certified this year with late changes that you had to make. That course is running on Sunday, April 18th, and registration closes April 11th. You'll find on the right side of your dashboard or on a coach's dashboard a link to coaches education courses, and that's where you and or your um, want-to-be head coaches can find that information. We are on track to do another COVID data collection this Friday. We will continue that as we move into spring sports. Um, know that on that page where you find that COVID data submission form, you can also find all of the ones that have been submitted and the compiled results for those. The most recent compiled result is on there from the very end of the spring season. I'm sorry, the end of the winter season. And then finally, um, MNI AAA has their conference next Monday and Tuesday held in a virtual format. Um, Minnesota State High School League has a number of sessions as part of that conference. Um, we'll be doing a website 101 session Monday and Tuesday at both eight o'clock and nine o'clock, um, same session each time um, with some material presented and some Q and A time also. LEAD will be held Monday at 1230 as part of the MNI AAA conference. And we will hold that through our MSHSL Zoom. So if there are any people who are not registered for that conference, as I know there are a few of you, 
um, that are non-ADs that join us. Um, that will be held in our MSHSL Zoom, and you can look for information from Susie to come out about that in a message. And then Eric will be doing a session Tuesday at 12.30, um, a leadership address, kind of a state of the league type of address um, with information. So add those to your calendar also as part of that conference. With that, um, Bob, I'll let you wrap up and move us forward. Yeah, one, one thing I'd like to mention, Laura, if we could go back to uh, baseball and with Game Changers. So uh, as head coaches, work with your head coaches as they're working through their preseason meeting. Uh, please note that the information regarding pitch count recording looks different. It's actually last year's language. This meeting was done in advance of uh, entering into um, an agreement with Game Changer for this year. Just note that that information will look different and the information that we most recently sent out on pitch counts should be the language that they use or the work that they should do around pitch counts. Good questions on that coming uh, uh, through to us as well. Otherwise, uh, that is it for today. Hopefully our weather holds out this week when we begin a majority of our competitions. Looks like there's rain moving in later in the week, but let's, uh, let's make sure we're competing and do so accordingly. Uh, to the guidance that we currently have. Have a great week. Again, thanks for all your work, and we will see you uh, again on Monday uh, coming from uh, MNI AAA uh, for our next lead. Thank you.